effect of Twitter been? Uh, like, do you think uh, like people have used it, it enough? Do you think people have used it in particularly inventive ways or something so, like that? I mean, it. From my observation, it does not really act as a virality tool. It does not act as a marketing tool, but. Uh, people are tweeting really cool levels and uh, people a lot of people are playing them and there's a core community forming that you can see on Twitter that there are few guys who are actively tweeting levels and they are also talking to each other and discussing say I like this part of the level or maybe there's an alternate solution here so that's very cool to watch okay. Okay. and these people who are talking to each other um, like do they know each other before no, or no, they just no. kind of met they kind of met by, uh, you know, tweeting levels. So that's oh, cool. nice. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, I mean, so Sociable started as a student project. So in my third year, I've been making games for um, since my first year of college, over five years now. Mm. And then I like decided to make a finished, polished product uh, when I was in the third year. So. Uh, I built that, the original version in XNA and C Sharp, which is a completely different technology than uh, Unity. It's a lower level thing. So I made uh, that game. It was like 2D, but it had a 3D physics component to it. So all of the physics were calculated in three dimensions. And I released that game on Desura. So it basically didn't make me any money, even though it was a paid game, but uh, it did get, basically Krishna is running. He, uh, when, um, I sent out press, rele press releases on the day before uh, releasing, in typical mm -hmm. noob fashion. Uh, yes. Well, like one website covered it, I guess, called IndieGames.com. Uh, so Krishna saw it on that website and then I guess he must have recognized that uh, my name sounds Indian. So he got in touch with me and added me to the local indie game devs group, which is how oh. eventually I wound up at NASCOM Gaming Forums um, NGDC. Oh, wow. And then that's where I met Shailesh, and then like uh, we decided to collaborate. Oh wow! I have to say this for Krishna. That's how he kind of got me into NASCOM as well. Uh, he saw a post of mine somewhere, uh, and he's like, "Oh, this, you know," and then finds me on Facebook, and he's like, "You should totally join us yeah. on NASCOM and local Indian game devs forums." And I was like, oh, "Okay." Yeah. Shit! I think that's how he got me in there too. <laughs> Holy shit, we need to like, you know, have like this massive... <laughs> it, it was, it's Krishna. Krishna. So Krishna has to blame for all the... for yeah. all the six guys being in that place, okay? Yep, Every, like, <laughs> we all basically just blame it on him now. We have a yeah. scapegoat. <laughs> so, yeah, the, uh, uh, go on. So, uh, you guys start to co uh, collaborate and... Uh, I remember like uh, Vivek and I had attended your talk at the last uh, Pune convention. So, uh, but yeah, if you could just reiterate like uh, a bit of that, that would be really nice. So, which talk are you talking about? Uh, uh, where you were talking about, you know, uh, Social Ball, how you guys started and the uh, dev cycle, uh, basically. Right, right, Some right. Uh, issues you faced along the way as well. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the newer version is a complete rewrite. It's not really it doesn't use any of the old ones source code because it's like built in an engine now unity so mm -hmm. uh, that's the first part so I, I did all of the programming myself programming and most like 99 percent of the art mm -hmm. and uh, shailish uh, did basically all of the level design some of the levels carried over but he also did a lot of ui design the primary uh, things where uh, we ran into trouble was uh, ui user interface so at that time, Unity 4.6 ship date wasn't announced at all. And there was no sign of Unity UI coming up. Hmm. So I built my own UI system and then suddenly Unity announces uh, GUIs in beta. And then suddenly after a while, you know, it came out of beta just as we, we were releasing. So I had to scrap around two or three weeks of work and then integrate Unity's system because that was much cooler and you could do lots of cool things in it. Uh, so that's the main thing. So that, like what what did uh, what did the new UI update add? And like what did what did, what did it make easier for you guys to do? Basically everything UI related. So before uh, the update came, if you wanted to have a button that does not look absolutely ugly, 
you have to create a sprite and then you have to handle uh, all of the click events and uh, make yeah, 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 something yeah, yeah. as easy as an input box that does not look but ugly was very difficult to do mm -hmm. and the new ui system added like uh, you can now use mechanism style animation <laughs> with, um, with the ui which is used heavily in social world which like social world does not have a main menu at all so everything just uh, comes in and out fluidly so all of that had to be done in the new system that was cool okay and uh, like uh, you've got like a really really minimalist uh, look on the game you know it's basically yeah. just uh, you know the tiles and the ball and even the tiles have like you know represent representational icons on them yeah um was you know was that intentional or was that just you know like uh, something that came out of uh, you know some constraints and just you know worked in your favor uh, it's I think both the original social ball had almost the same graphics, slightly different colors, but also uh, almost the same graphics on all of the tiles. So uh, the first thing it was designed like the original version was designed for a contest I had gone to for Windows 8 apps. So uh -huh. uh, so that's why I had followed the Metro design style from the very beginning. Right. Um, and then the original social ball uh, was actually a 2D game, as I just said. So. All of the sprites I created in uh, an open source uh, vector tool called uh, Inkscape. So all of those sprites had to be such that their isometric shapes should be easy to recreate in that tool. Okay. So uh, that's how the simplicity arose. I couldn't have complex shadows and stuff like that in the original social ball at all because it was like purely 2D. Okay. So interestingly enough, you can't even tell the like difference between the newer one and the older one. I think that's uh, like one of the good things about the older one, hmm. you can't really tell the difference between a 2D and a 3D game. That's nice. Yeah. Mm, cliched question, but what inspired you for social media? So as an inspired, I'm not sure. So uh, yeah, so since the very beginning, like the mechanic was not something I focused on. So. Um, there was this idea in my head that Twitter can be used as a as a data sharing platform. So that was like maybe before all the cloud platforms were as prevalent as they are right now. But uh, so like in an extreme case, I imagine you could like possibly pirate or maybe stream movies from and to Twitter. Like just encode the white data and tweet it, right? Which <laughs> <laughs> nice. is ridiculous, but you know it's kind of might be possible. So. I mean, the whole concept arose from that. Having a puzzle platform where the entire level data should be tweetable. And this was like just before NDC, NGDC, the whole thing was about to be tweeted in the actual tweet. So the level data was encoded in the tweet itself and not in the image. Wow. So we showed this to Rami Ismail um, at NGDC, this year's NGDC, like 2014's yeah. NGDC. And he suggested that the guy uh, who made Spore, one of the guys, not well, right? One of the guys who made Spore and also what's the what's the game musical game where you are on, on an island. Um, the which game on an island? The musical game where you are on, on an island. Um, musical. Um, it's like all pixelated. Sonata? No. Uh, no, no. Um, you said uh, it's pixelated. Pixelated. Anyways. Yeah. I'll maybe remember it later. So some guy, guys had already done this, but not in the context of Twitter. So Rami suggested that, and I kind of went home and implemented that in, I think, three days or so. so oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I remember, see, uh, like, I remember seeing on Twitter, you were talking about steganography and how you got the idea from Rami Ismail. Mm -hmm. you, yeah. you, you managed to do something like that pretty quickly. How hard was it to implement something like that? So actually it was not that hard because uh, Facebook completely screws up your photos. It's like it destroys every uh, mm. freaking section of your photos. But Twitter is not that bad. So it, if you say tweet a small image, manageable image, it will keep that PNG, which is not lossy at all. So it's, mm. it's, a, it's a lossless format. So uh, And there's already a, an open source library uh, for Unity for steganography, not for use oh. with Twitter. So I had to modify it mm. quite a bit in order to make uh, it work with Twitter. But I got the base, like core idea from there. And the fact that Twitter does not use lossy um, encoding helped. So I didn't have to 
एक कॉम्प्लेक्स एल्गोरिथम हम्म सो लाइक इन दैट केस लाइक जस्ट इंप्लीमेंटिंग दिस शेयरिंग स्टफ ऑन फेसबुक एंड ट्विटर इज नॉट गोइंग टू बी लाइक पॉसिबल नो इट्स गोइंग टू बी रियली हार्ड बिकॉज़ फेसबुक आई थिंक कन्वर्ट्स एवरीथिंग इनटू अ जेपेग व्हिच इज नॉट स्टोर्ड पिक्सेल बाय पिक्सेल ओके सो so did you guys have facebook sharing on social wall or did you just drop it all together no we never even considered it because okay. not any other platform because it it just adds to the complexity even twitter is mm-hmm. the most complex part of the game right now as uh, when it comes to maybe porting it to other platforms mm-hmm. or even supporting it mm-hmm. so yeah that's interesting like what are the parts of twitter's api that make it that complex it's not the twitter's api that's an issue it's okay it's, the part that integrates with um, unity so if you want to send say web requests in unity that's easy they have their own thing called www there's a class mm-hmm. but um, say the thing with twitter is you don't want the user to enter his u- user id and password in a text box of your game right that's just plain creepy so you yeah. want something oauth oh. enabled so Uh, the way it works is you click on say connect twitter and then it pops up an in game browser which is the hardest part hmm. and then redirecting from that browser to the game and so we used a plugin prime 31 hmm. i mean i did a lot of research on how to do it without the plugin but it's like super hard okay and like how has the response been to social ball like any particular feedback that you liked um like overall the response has been overwhelmingly overwhelmingly positive both critical response as well as uh, user reviews uh, and so we are working on a few features right now which i guess i don't know i, I can't commit to a timeline but they should be done soon and up on the store so we are working on the first update let's hope that happens soon so we are like we have listened to some of the feedback and uh, especially the one that's like low hanging fruit we are looking to implement it right now Okay uh can you tell us what sort of features these may be Yeah sure uh, so the first one is preview so um people want to see a preview of what the level looks like after it has been tweeted so what the level looks like to a player who is approaching the level so as in if you have unlocked a tile it should appear missing right on the board and so on so uh, we are working on adding a preview mode that does not clutter up the interface that's always been a focus so It, like new feature shouldn't clutter up the existing uh, simplicity of the game and then another primary feature is uh, we are trying to improve snapping so on smaller devices uh, the sla- snapping can be a bit of a problem so we are working on maybe making it a bit smarter okay yes snapping. yes i face that a lot yeah sorry for that <laughs> <laughs> so yeah All right, that's pretty cool actually. And like uh how long do you think these will take or uh, okay, or more appropriately, how long do you uh till these would be live? Um like they should be live in Feb, that's for sure. I can't mm-hmm. say when within Feb. So uh, I guess the update should be done in 10 days or so. I mean, it requires rigorous testing because uh, as you add more features and if the game is live, we don't want to screw anything up. So the testing will take more time than actual development but for right. running like you know week or 10 days the whole thing should be done and after that uh, however the uh, however long the review process take it will take okay okay cool so you've been working on some other stuff than social ball or like if you want to talk anything else social ball then like now is the time no 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 like okay <laughs> so you've been working on some unreal engine 4 stuff yep Can you tell us a bit more about that? What that is? Yeah. So um, the Unreal Engine, I've I've always had this attraction towards uh, developing AAA games. And when I say AAA, I don't mean necessarily big budget games, but primarily the ones that pose an engineering challenge. So that's why game development is primarily fun for me. It's like the whole art form and uh, maybe the fun aspect of it is secondary, but it's one of the most uh, technologically challenging engineering. Is there is I think maybe after aerospace <laughs> I don't know but uh, so I've been getting into Unreal Engine for development which is like hardcore C plus plus from the programming perspective it's a lot harder than uh, getting started with Unity and so uh, I, there's this ambitious project that I've been working on is like generating a large city so 
that's the thing i'm working on so uh, is uh, making a procedural city and also making it uh, controllable by hand so when someone says procedural generation you can take two approaches the first is like complete random generation which is something like uh, no man's sky is doing i believe so they have like a set of equations and every single thing is being generated procedurally so you cannot tweak anything by hand if you wanted to you would have to tweak the equation and that would most likely have side effects so what i want to do is not nearly as vast as uh, no man's sky but have something like uh, you click a button and at compile time it designs and uh, generates an entire city and then you can tweak the city by hand so oh. that's what i'm working on and i uh, i'm also like making weekly progress and weekly vlogs video logs and posting them on youtube so they are fairly technical but if you uh, like work in unreal engine 4 or even in unity uh, they'll probably be pretty interesting mm. I didn't know you were posting vlogs. That makes you our competition. We shouldn't have done this podcast. <laughs> I, I'd like to see this as collaboration. It's like you know, Wonder Twins unite sort of moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, like, tell us about your experience working with Unreal Four. Like, what do you, like you've also worked on Unity. So, what do you like in Unity that isn't in Unreal Four, and vice versa? I mean, both are completely different beasts. Uh, if I wanted to prototype something quickly or maybe make a mobile game, I definitely go with Unity. Uh, Unity has a very friendly learning curve, so you can just get started. C Sharp is a pretty easy language, and it's also pretty powerful. Um, but I mean, I've seen Unity five screenshots, the newer version, and even those don't really compare to what Unreal Engine four can provide. plus as a whole the ue4 toolkit is i think more mature not ue4 but unreal engine like uh, especially their uh, infrastructure code infrastructure is more mature than even unity i mean unreal engine is more cutting edge while unity is more um, friendlier i guess hmm. so but like how easy is it to use those cutting edge features like will even like a lone developer be able to employ all of that stuff or so you would need to be a skilled lone developer so i mean you can't just get started and say i want to move an object and let's say transform dot x plus plus that it doesn't work like that so it uses c plus plus which is unforgiving because um you get like access to direct pointers which you can screw up and if you do screw up it will just crash there's no friendly uh, like give an exception but continue like you know it will just crash and sometimes it garbage collects things so in fact unreal engine core has its own almost its own variant of c++ you have to tell they have their own reflection system in place so it will take a long time for you to uh, especially if you're a programmer so if you're approaching it from c++ and it will take some time but unreal engine has this blueprint system Where you can generate visually, you can write your own program. So that might appeal to you. It does not appeal to me because, uh, say, making something simple, like having, say, you are generating something, and that takes five lines of C plus plus. That will take an entire screen in Blueprint. It's not concise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Blueprint is not conducive to building your own game. Blueprint is conducive to like building a portfolio level. Uh, Yeah, I think that's what it's for. It's not for someone who's building a game. Yeah, uh, I I have not taken a good look at Unreal Engine for source code. I've taken a couple of looks at, at it, but so far a lot of it is reminiscent of what I've seen in Unreal Script. Okay. Just like you know, a more low-level version of what Unreal Script does. No, like that's I think where you go wrong because right now you're talking about there are semicolons in this, there are semicolons in that. and that's true of c sharp as well. that doesn't make any sense but if you want to talk technically then i think there's a huge difference so i i don't know unreal script to be uh, fair but like the primary difference is in how memory is managed so if you want to get technical like c sharp yeah, yeah. Um, memory has to be allocated on the heap so it's like c sharp is treating you with kid gloves he uh, you want uh, to instantiate an object to be allocated on the heap and then you like you can't screw up basically in c in uh, c++ you can allocate anything wherever you want i i was talking about unreal script and uh 
and uh, Unreal Engine 4 though, not about Unity Engine. But then I think Unreal, Unreal Script is also managed if I'm not wrong. So, I mean, you might be talking about the API, like get actor location, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about that. I'm talking about in general, uh, like how, like how it, API. like at a base so, level, everything yeah, still is. Ah, that, uh, that's, that's, that's what... But in huh? actual development terms, um, there's, I believe, a lot of difference between C++. So, the, it's like... I, it's like, I imagine you have a lot more control now than you did in Unreal Script. Uh, yes, yeah. At a basic level, you can... Yeah, like you said, memory management is the world of a difference. Yes, you, you have... A, there is definitely a cushion in terms of memory management and stuff like that in Unreal Script. Yeah. But... I don't know. Like, as long as I can still do build, like, you know, custom classes that allow me to do what I want to do, I'm mm-hmm. fine. But I'm I think not, where... I am not, I am not a programmer who yeah. like, goes deep into an engine and dig and find out stuff. But I can yeah. build custom classes even in C++. That I can still do. Yeah. Uh, that but do where what you, I want. UE4 gets really powerful is you can extend the engine itself because all of the engine source code is available, which is, like, absolutely amazing. Yeah. You can just, like, extend the editor and people are already doing that. So I could do that, for example, I could make my own building interface, which is explicitly made for my purposes, which is cool. Okay, so uh, tell us about what you're making in Unreal 4. So as I said, I'm making a procedural building generation thing. So um, I so if you follow my vlog, so in the first uh, uh, video I tried, so in the first week I tried a voxel based approach like Minecraft, mm-hmm. a little bit like Minecraft, not exactly. But that didn't really pan out because it had a few shortcomings. So after that I wrote my own thing where you can basically define a set of vertices, points in space, and it'll like, imagine you're looking at a building top down from the sky, and then you can plot out points the outline of the building in points and then it will generate the building from those points dynamically you can add uh, say the height you can add a lot of stuff parameters and then it will mesh those buildings automatically for you and apply a material over them hmm. so pretty uh, scalable solution okay so, uh, so like how are you generating how are you generating the material that's extremely exciting so i just um, I just uploaded a video around half an hour ago. You should check it out. So I'm doing something that I don't see anybody else doing as far as like I saw on the internet. So see the building is, com- is composed of modular meshes, right? Yeah. So there's this window mesh, this door mesh, blah, blah, blah. So what most people are doing is they assign a single material or a single texture per mesh, right? There's this brick yeah. texture that goes on a single wall. But yeah. then what happens is you have to tailor that uh, material carefully. So if you have two walls next to each other, you shouldn't be able to see the seam. Right? Uh-huh. You shouldn't yeah. be able to see where they are connected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The they should yeah. align perfectly and they should, yes. it shouldn't look like... Yeah. It shouldn't but look then, like it's procedural. Exactly. It shouldn't look like it's modular. It should look like yeah. it's a one wall. But then you have limitations that you can have, say, a stain or something across meshes, right? You can't have yeah. like LG or whatever automatically at least. So what I'm doing is I made this very cool thing, which I basically automatically map a single material across modular meshes. That means you just watch the video and it will be clear. It's like a 10 minute video. Uh, so you can map a single material. Like you can have anything you want, which is mapped across the entire surface. And if you're familiar with UVs, so I basically manually adjust the UVs of the material per mesh at generation time. Oh wow! Okay. So that's super cool. The part, that's like I mean, the last part is the only part that made sense to me. I like I still don't know how it would look right if you mapped a single material across multiple modular exactly. meshes. Exactly. You you won't be able to tell. That's the beauty of it. So you say. And these meshes don't even need to be uniformly scaled. You can have a wall that's just like super long and you won't yeah, be able no, no, to... Like, I, like, I understand exactly what you're doing. It's just I how you're doing it. Exactly. Uh, just check that video out. Man. I just published it. <laughs> it sounds awesome. It sounds yeah. freaking mind-blowing. I've got to look at this video. Yeah. Uh, I've seen the first three. Uh, I, I will take a look at this. Yeah. Has everyone else gone to sleep? No, <laughs> no, I, was no. Just, I, I thought you were like, Apoor was saying something. Yeah. Yeah. 
didn't want to interrupt but okay uh, so so oh, all right like why why the jump from unity to unreal engine 4 like i mean uh, also what what platform do you see yourself developing games for or that, that doesn't really matter you just have an idea and you work towards making that idea so i mean i see myself working on both basically in the long term i'd like to work on unreal engine 4 because i really want to get into console slash pc uh, games okay so for that and like 3d games so for that i'll okay. obviously go with ue4 a lot of power there yeah i need to i mean the next thing i make i probably will move to ue4 just to see if i remember how to use c++ i think using unreal yeah. script for such a long time has spoiled me <laughs> yeah. because it makes life really easy that's the one great thing about unreal script yeah it, it, and you don't get that in uh, ue4 at all i think there's like third party plugins called skookum script or something oh, which you might have used so on awesome. sleeping dogs conan is awesome i love that guy yeah uh he is he's a genius if i can use skookum i have no problem like i i'm fucking master at skookum yeah uh, <laughs> but i'll probably try and like skookum is basically uh, uh slightly like you have you have a bit more like this you have a bit more leverage you can do a lot more stuff in skookum than you can in lua uh, mm-hmm. but yeah i wonder i wonder if i'll be able to hack it with unreal or i'll just get lazy and start using blueprint yeah. <laughs> uh so i mean okay when, like when like you said uh, initially the the idea for the for the game that you're working on now when did you have the idea to like make a procedural world generating kind of so i mean um, this is like a, almost everything i do nowadays stems for from one mantra you can call it maybe So I saw this talk, GDC talk by the makers of Rogue Legacy. If you have played yeah. that game, I love that game. Cellar Door. Door. Is that what they call? What? Uh, like I played Rogue Legacy. Yes, yeah. I know what they talk. So in their talk, what they, like the game was made on a super low budget. So what they talk about is make systems and not content. Uh, so that's my focus for uh, see, like. That's a mantra I can get behind. Yeah. so make systems not content so all of the thing i do so if i say wanted to generate like for example in this case i wanted to make a free free running game so the way i would do that my primary thing is i love mirror search i hate the fact that it does not allow you to like freely roam <coughs> it's just a linear path so what would it take to maybe generate a large environment so a lot of guys would say it takes millions of dollars of uh, uh, a budget and then you need like 300 artists and blah 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 but i don't think that's the case at all so i just think that ne- there need to be specific systems that need to be built in order to support this and yeah you know you need to build the systems first yes so that's my focus building systems and not content okay that sounds like a very extra like i don't know maybe i'm being a dick that sounds like something out of an extra credits video uh Mm. Yeah. it's not a bad thing it is definitely a very good thing building systems yeah. not content so i mean uh, uh, social ball is also an extension of that if you check it out the whole game is a system it's not like i didn't make the levels so shailesh made them and the community is making them i just take care of making sure the system works correctly uh, hmm. uh have you ever uh, like made just like coded an engine from scratch or something like that that really depends so like what do you how do you define an engine right like, like you know like gets like you you try to code something that puts polygons on screen like i haven't like <laughs> a blank visual studio solution i haven't and i don't really want to because mm-hmm. it's like reinventing the wheel and i don't necessarily see myself as an engine programmer mm-hmm. i see myself as either a gameplay programmer or tools programmer so okay uh, but i did write an engine sort of thingy i i i like calling it a framework instead of engine sounds way less pretentious so for the original social world so there's a lot of 3d math going on so converting everything in the correct world space from to the correct uh, screen space and so on so i don't know i would call it a framework but not an engine okay so uh, do you like any experience like making your framework or do you like just prefer like working with pre- like pre existing engines so i like the engineering challenge of like both 
things have their own engineering challenge right hmm. so with engines it's like making use of the correct systems in such a way that it makes everything efficient and it fits in like cohesively and then with frameworks it's more like how do you uh, generate your own api and so on hmm. i don't think those are two very different challenges now that i think about it i don't know no that's fine like i was just wondering because like i'm more of a person who does like my own engine programming so i was okay uh, like i wanted to know what the difference is because i tried working with like unreal way back and yeah. i worked with source a lot okay so i didn't like source very much so like that's why i actually started like programming my own engine because like i didn't like working with pre existing one okay so for so me it's interesting choice. to know like somebody who's on like the other side of the yeah exactly side. and also like even in a even in a development level like arvind your philosophy is probably not necessarily completely aligned with the uh, boots because you're more on creating like tailored experiences right for the player you want to control how they feel from beginning to end right yeah like yeah definitely more on that so, like i'm not like i don't do like systems in the sense of that like i'm more into narrative so yeah. it's yeah. a bit different so why why don't you two fight <laughs> <laughs> no it's like it's fine like yeah to each his own uh, yeah yeah absolutely yeah. i'm somewhere i like i'm mm-hmm. somewhere in between which Personally, i don't know like uh, like i like the fact like in, on my own engine that like i know everything that's going on so yeah like i know everything like the though. ui framework the yeah. graphics if something goes wrong i know exactly what's happened and stuff like that yeah So I don't know. It, like to me, at least, it it feels like like I've sort of drank the Kool Aid. So now I can't go back. I cannot <laughs> like surrender control of like several parts to somebody else's. Yeah. But then the yeah. fact is, you can't make something as sophisticated as you could using other people's. Like, uh, for example, in Unreal Engine for Unity, a lot of man hours and very skilled man hours have gotten uh, gone into the engine. Hmm. So I, I Giving you a set of tools that are super powerful. Yeah, exactly, and then I build on top of them to generate mm. systems that make content. I mean, I'm I am not a good programmer, but I've done stuff in Unreal Engine that even in three I've done stuff that I would like probably not be able to do if I was building my own game in yeah. XNA or something like that. Yeah. Uh, like even Unity, I've been able to build stuff in Unity that. I would not be able to do if I was just building things from scratch because it's just it can be a headache, man. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. Like, I don't. I've never felt like too restricted. I guess because I don't focus much on the graphics side of stuff. So maybe it's yeah. because of that. And like, yes. uh, at least for me, like since my, like I usually tend to go with like games where like it's a bunch of content and stuff. So you, uh, like, I find working with 2D much more easier because. Yeah. Like three D, like it's like you need a lot more resources just to get the same basic stuff in. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, though like though like I I still play three D games, so there is that like. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, any other like uh, any other like tell us something that's like a a really amazing feature like in Unreal Four or something that you are a huge fan of. I mean the whole engine is freaking amazing. I mean, yeah, but look, like more specific. No, like I I I don't really care for one specific feature. But if you look at the way they are developing the engine, that is the future of software development. I mean I'm blown away by the way they're doing things. Uh, the general manager and other like top guys or maybe rendering guys come on every week. They do a weekly Twitch broadcast. They tell uh, people what features are being developed. So it's like they're basically openly developing the software and also in, uh, they also merge community contribution so it's like it's it's such a massive project but it still has it's still open it's still spearheaded by one organization and uh, they have like they are moving to public uh, like bug tracking and so on which is just amazing i mean imagine if windows was built in such a way like os you are using 
Hmm. You could just <laughs> download a cutting edge version of Windows 10 from their GitHub uh, and then build and install it on your machine. I think there was an OS that was actually built like this. Like, like that, like that, that is the future of development. That's what excites me the most. It's the only company I see building something this open, this this big, this open. Yeah, I guess it's more of like they're I mean, getting the open source ethos in games. I guess. Well, I mean, open source. I mean, Car- Carmack is probably a huge proponent of open source. Probably bigger than the guys at Epic, but the development process of the id engines have never been public. Yeah. He never, he, like, he talks about it at QuakeCon. He'll talk about mega textures and stuff like that. At yeah. He will not sit down and explain why he's doing something or why he's adding something to the to id tech four or id tech five. Uh, yeah. It's it's interesting though. Like, I want to see if it take five is open source. Uh, mm. It'll be interesting to see if that's happened now that he's left. Uh, yeah. It. Uh, well, uh, but I, yeah. I don't know because it take uh, like the, based on like how they're going along. I don't think they have the same like being vendors is not exactly. what they want. Like but Epic is doing that because they like finally had some competition in Unity, so. I think yeah. they're doing it because of that. I mean, they have been an engine vendor for way long, uh, since way before Unity was even, I think, uh, Unity even existed. No, yeah, so, but like earlier they would just like, earlier like Unreal would just be like this engine that you get. And like you didn't have a say in the development of it. So, you might, but I think it costed a lot more. Basically. Yeah, yeah, so that's the difference, right? Like it, it wasn't democratized the same yeah. way like their GitHub yeah. repo is now. Yeah. So, how is the community around Unreal Engine 4? It's brilliant. Okay. Is it better because... or worse than Dota? Wow. Dude. <laughs> Come on. There's no comparison. It's probably a much, much better than Dota. Exactly. Uh, now, that, now I realize that like, oh, no. uh, like... like the community around UDK is still pretty awesome. If you like, uh, there's a there's just like the only the only advantage I'd say that that I'm working in UDK is that the, the amount of resources that you can go look at now is is a lot more than what you can look at for UE4. But the advantage yeah. of UE4 is that if you're working on it now, you're pretty much on the edge. Like you exactly. are, you're doing, everything you do is new. So yes. probably what will happen is some asshole like me will come like one year later and look at what people like Apurva and all are doing and try and use that to make what they want to make. So- until then, I'll probably have my thing as an asset on the asset store, which you can directly yeah, yeah. buy. Yeah, yeah. Like, by then, you'll probably be selling it on the Unreal Engine asset store. Exactly. Maybe. So, I don't know. Yeah, do you it go like, definitely a challenge as far as dev is concerned. You sometimes have to go and uh, uh, look at the source code in order to figure things out, which is a bit scary. But it's cool as well. Hmm. Yeah. Like Unity and like with like has sort of been responsible to bring the asset store model. Yeah. Now there are like so I guess it's more of a thing where like they are sort of the main vendor, but at the same time lots of other people can basically engines are going free to play. <laughs> That's what Unity <laughs> is doing, right? Yeah. Engines are going free to play. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. That sounds terrifying, you know, engines are great. like, I mean, it's a great thing because it's going to democratize. Uh, you need 10 gems to compile your code. <laughs> no, it won't be that. It won't be that. It will be stuff like, uh, you know, it will be stuff like you want the cool new tool we're doing. Uh, then you pay a little bit extra for this plugin or something like that. It will be like what Unreal does for updates, right? It's not that you have to pay $20 in perpetuity to keep. Yeah using or making games in Unreal is that for the next update, you need to pay 20 bucks. So you don't need to pay for the rest of the year, but maybe at the end of the year, you pay $20, you get all the updates in a row, something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then you run the risk of like the game that you've been working on so far might not compile anymore because you've not been updating. Yeah, the, game. the more the jump between the versions, like yeah. if, for example, you start with 4.1 and it's at 4.6, there's more of a chance of stuff not working. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, like these are interesting times. Like I don't know, like how, what this means for game development, but yeah, like the one thing I would say that, that I don't know, I find it interesting that now there's a like there are like massive asset stores for every engine where you can buy stuff in bulk everywhere. Like the weird thing I find about Unity is that the Unity community used to be like a, 
like a lot more helpful in terms of if you had a question uh, before the asset store came out. Now that that's out, everyone will just point you and say, go buy this for 50 bucks. So your chances of like, if you come in at an entry level and you want to learn stuff, it might be a little bit harder, according to me. Yeah. A little, but I mean, yeah, that's just the way it is, I guess. Hmm. Yeah, it is interesting though, like, uh, because usually like free to play models work with a critical mass. So I guess Epic are kind of banking on there being a large wave of like independent developers. Like it's, yeah, like it's in, like these are interesting times, but like, I don't know what the end, like how this will look at the end once. Let's see. Yeah. Maybe that, uh, maybe that guy's blog post will be true and you know, this will lead to like, uh, a lot of riffraff will come into the to the nice neighborhoods. Uh, yeah. Who's that guy? The bottom feeder. I don't remember. Jeff Vogel, I think. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. hard to complain about bottom feeders with now, like, the, like I can't complain about bottom feeders. So, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Like, yeah, I'm not the, like, I mean, grumpy look, old guy. I'm, I'm really, really happy that it's gotten to the point where, like, a game like Dead God University is a game being made locally in Gerd and Puna by these guys called DSK Green Eyes Games. It got greenlit in five days. Hmm. Uh, Arvind, you put your game like what two years ago? It took one and a half years to get greenlit, right? It got greenlit yeah, sometime. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, one and a half years. Like five days is huge, and it's not like Dead God University got a lot of press or anything. No one, no one see anything about it. Hmm. It's it awesome that possible. that is possible now. Uh, it means that at least, like, no matter where you are, your game might get a shot. If if people think it's interesting, if people think it's something they want to play, you might get a shot at getting on Steam. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Steam is definitely going towards more open. Like, that, that that's actually one of the reasons, like, Greenlight is... Like, Greenlight two years ago was this huge obstacle. And there was yeah. this thing called, like, a lot of the community was, like, being worthy on Steam. Like... Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's that's gone now, like because yeah. there's just a lot of content on Steam, and now it's going to be down to the curation stuff that they're doing, you know, mm. that stuff. So we'll see what happens there. It's going to be an interesting, like I mean, it's always interesting. Game development is never boring, but this, like, I don't know, I don't want to call it democratization, but the the access to game <laughs> development is a lot easier. It seems a lot more people are going to try new games. I guess. Yeah, like. Apoor, like, do you have anything like about the future of games? Like, obviously, very vague question, but I have no clue, man. I'm uh, like probably the newest guy to game development among all of us right now. So I don't know. Nah, it's it's fine. All of us don't make real games. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I think it's always a matter of who you want to compete with. For example, Flappy Bird is always going to be easy to make, but it depends on how much engineering and artistic time you spend on it, how much you polish it in order to uh, differentiate yourself from the other guys. Yeah. Yeah, that's my take on it. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we, we could, like, let's stop talking about the future of game development. Once we're all bankrupt in five years and writing grumpy blog posts, we can come back. Sure. We'll probably be doing stand-up comedy somewhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can see that. My life as an Indian game developer. And, like, Arvind is down on game development because this week he went to a conference and, like, a lot of people told him games and walked yeah. away from disgust. Yeah, there was, like, an advertising <laughs> conference <laughs> which some people, you know, like, I don't know if I can tell who they were, but... Like some people were like, hey, this is a good conference. So I was like, yeah, sure, since it's in Jaipur, I'll just go and... Yeah. They were just like... There's a conference in Jaipur and someone told you it's good. I mean, didn't that raise any red flags? Well, like, this was the the week after the Jaipur Lit Fest, right? So... Oh, fine. I knew the Literature Festival was going to be mentioned. That's the one thing that happens in Jaipur. (laughs) That's like (laughs) anywhere near human civilization. Jaipur apart from tourism. Yeah, so, I mean, it was like an advertising industry kind of event. So I was like, yeah, like, like I don't know who thought that the gaming and this would be there. But like, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll go there. And what and did like, they talk about? Like, what sort of ads? 
well so so okay so this conference was called stream all right and uh, and they it was an unconference so by unconference they mean there's no schedule and you can set your own talks and stuff like that in practice what it means is that nothing is organized and if you don't have like meetings and stuff set up before you come here uh -huh. like there's no use like you, like a newbie can't come in there oh and, uh, Like it it sounds like more of a I don't know. Is this a very business oriented conference where you go to like network and make contacts and set up business meetings and business? Yeah, well, a lot of big people were there. Like I personally don't watch Master Chef, but apparently, like the the guy from Master Chef was there. And what is Master Chef? What What is he doing there? Because it's like related to advertising, TV, that kind of thing, right? So a lot of people. Okay. Like okay. this was an invite-only conference, so they so apparently like there was some barrier to entry, but then I got in, so I don't know how low that was. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, like basically, like nobody outside of gaming in India has any clue or any respect or anything about games. So we can forget <laughs> like this being stream for a long time. I don't think time. a lot of people talking about gaming in India. I'm sorry, have can you repeat that? <laughs> well, I was saying like nobody outside gaming had any respect or clue about gaming, so. In India, yeah, yeah in sure. India, yeah. probably if you talk to them about Rovio and uh, Angry Birds, they'll have a lot of respect immediately. And what I said co co counter to that is that a lot of people in gaming in India don't have a lot of respect for the industry in India. <laughs> Are you googling the Master Chef guy? I don't know. The game is like Master Chef is a lot of places, right? So like Master Chef. Is... I know it must be that Vikas or somebody. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so yeah, like basically advertising it like what the event was that like I was there with my game. Next to me was a drone company who do drone photography stuff like that. Then oh, next to that, the shit, some... that sounds awesome. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, they, you could even fly the drone. Like, oh, if wow. you get a, if you get to fly a drone. Yeah, I even killed a few people with it. It was pretty. <laughs> no, cool. I don't care that like fine whatever. But did you get to fly a drone seriously? Yeah, like for a bit. Like he wouldn't let me like too much, but like just a little bit. That's sure. awesome. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Even though this conference, like, even though the people didn't care about games, you got to fly a drone. You got something out of it. Yeah, it's pretty fine. Yeah. Uh, then there was some cool augmented reality stuff. Like there was this guy from Gurgaon who was making something. Uh, it was like, like if you print like P on a paper, right? For element symbol of phosphorus, your yeah. phone could scan that, and uh, so. Uh, like a cube would show up in the camera, which had like phosphorus in it, and if you like, for example, have a water, like you know H two O, right? H two O. Then you combine them, you get a reaction. That was pretty cool. Like all augmented reality. So it was happening like in there. Cool. It's it's hard to describe that without like in person. It seemed really really cool. But like cool. when I describe it, it's like yeah. It he was doing that for education stuff, like you know, to like teach kids and all that. Okay. So, uh, did you yeah, have? This sounds like the worst place for a game developer to go. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, like, did you converse with anyone about your game or the game industry and what yeah. did they think and like just just what were their opinions? Well, like there were a few people from Hindustan Times who were like, yeah, cool. Like finally somebody's making games about Indian mythology. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, like I was like, yeah, well, thank you. Like I'll make a chota bheem game next. So. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I don't know this. Can't help you problem to that events. Yeah. Then like there was a really like funny lady from Nestle like who was like who was who was pretty encouraging. She was like yeah okay that's completely fine. She was some executive level person. But uh -huh. then she was like well I really want to work with you guys but I can't figure out how to convert like your game to like get, have a break get a Kit Kat. So <laughs> that was funny. Oh wow. Well that's easy right? We'll fight for food so yeah. Damn it! Yeah, I should have bought the 50%, other game. Fifty percent, fifty percent of revenue is mine now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He pretty much like got you Nestle, man. Yeah, I should contact him. Uh, did you get like a card or something? Is, yeah, that is the best. Have a break, get a Kit Kat. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, so, so okay, yeah. Uh, like, the, yeah, the conference was an interesting experience, as I would say. Like, the only part I didn't like was that they expected me to stand. On my booth for like from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. I was like, "What the fuck? Like, I need a salary if I'm going to do this." 
yeah so i like all the like the hotel was okay like it was a nice like heritage hotel you know built like a palace everything uh-huh. so i so i was just like like every day just go after lunch because i was like yeah well, fuck this i'm not paid enough or like i'm not paid period for this Oh, uh, I don't think there's anything else. So anyway, uh, yeah, I think we should call it for this week. So yeah. So after that uh, really exciting that's bunch the podcast of for this week, guys. Like, what else do we have week. to talk about? Bye. Uh-